And um, I'm going to turn things over to David. Uh, he owns a, a ja uh, I almost said Jaguar. <laughs> he owns a, a Ford Mustang Mach E. Uh, and it's one of the many electric vehicles that have been launched or will be launched um, in the next year or so. You might have heard of the Volkswagen ID4 and the uh, Ionic and the Lucid Air and you know, the next couple of years will be a very interesting period where we, you know, there's gonna be a lot more variety of choices uh, electric vehicles. And so this is one that has definitely generated uh, quite a bit of attention. Uh, David had brought his um, uh, Maki to our EV parade last weekend. And, and I, I, uh, usually you see those uh, that people swarm around the car like when it's a Tesla, to be honest with you. So I'm used to people not paying attention to my car because I, I have a Nissan Leaf, I have a Bolt, Bolt, Chevy Bolt now, but uh, but yeah, people were just swarming all over David's car because it's obviously something new and it's a really, really cool vehicle. With that, I will uh, turn it over to David. Okay, okay. Uh, Charles and I did a test yesterday and the internet was working okay. It's been a challenge at my home this morning and we lost it about a half hour ago. So I have relocated to the Montpelier Center uh, out here in Western Hanover County. If y'all know where that is, it's northwest of uh, Fort Pump about a half hour. This is where I met Charles and learned about your organization. Last summer, I think you were out here for a farmer's market. So it's kind of neat to be back here and sharing uh, uh, some information about our new electric car. My wife and I are so excited. It's kind of our car, but it's really her car. She's not here with me right now, so uh, she let me borrow it for a while. I'd like to give you a little background and history of myself and my interest in, in Mustangs, especially. This, this brand has been around since 1964. Uh, my very first car that I bought in 1973 when I was a teenager, first job was, was a 69 Mach 1 Mustang uh, during the uh, era of, of uh, fast cars and, uh, and uh, muscle cars, they called them back then. You know, the poor gas mileage, I think I got 10 miles to the gallon, had a huge engine and big tires. Uh, Charles, I'm going to try to switch the camera here so I can do it. I've got a little model here. This this is a model of my 1969 Mach 1 Mustang. So Mach 1 stands for the speed of sound, and that has relevance to the current day uh, model, Mach E, and I'll, I'll tie that together in a minute. And I was saying I also have a, a, now a 1968 um, Mustang convertible, and I wish I could show that to you, but we've had it out in our family for 27 years. And my wife and I have always been interested in adding another Mustang to our stable, to our uh, garage. And it never worked because they were always almost two-seater sports cars, too low to the ground. We like driving SUVs, car with a little more height. And uh, anyway, about three, four years ago, we heard that Ford was going to build a Mustang-inspired SUV. And they didn't say anything about it being electric then. But as time went on, we followed the progression of the development of this vehicle. They kept saying it could be Mustang inspired. Then they said it was going to be an electric vehicle. And that made me even more excited. I've worked for an electric utility my whole career. I now work uh, uh, for Rappahannock Electric Cooperative. And I'll, I'll tell you more about things we've got going on at Rappahannock in, in a little bit. But uh, any, anyhow, um, the excitement continued to grow as we learned that this is going to be a, a high performance, uh, sort of mid size, small size SUV. That was going to be Mustang inspired. And then we heard it was going to be called a Mach 1. And I think the Mustang enthusiasts sort of raised a lot of uh, uh, pain about that and said, you can't use a, a brand, you know, from the, from the eras of the 60s and 70s. That's too, uh, too, too important to uh, the Mustang heritage of history. So they tweaked it and became known as the Mach E, uh, E for electric, obviously. And then they put the Mustang brand on it and put the pony on it. And that's just so cool. So when they did the unveil back in uh, at Los Angeles in November of 2019, my wife and I watched that live stream that night. And that night, we, we put in a reservation for this car. So it's been over, almost a year and a half ago that we uh, first decided after seeing it, uh, you know, part of the reveal that we were going to do this. Then last July, we were able to put in the order um, of what we wanted. We wanted red. All of our Mustangs have always been red. And we kind of took it from there and we waited patiently and waited for our turn and we learned that it could be uh, assembled. We thought in December it was assembled in early January and then arrived at Richmond Ford the first uh, weekend in February. So we've had it a little over a month and had, had great fun with it. So uh, I can do a little walk around now, Charles, if you're still hearing me and seeing everything okay. Okay. All right. So, so the front, and I've got, I've got the, uh, the hood open here. Obviously, we don't, we don't have an engine here. We have a, uh, an empty cavity, a compartment. It's got a built-in sort of storage there, um, and, and we haven't used this yet. I guess we could put 
groceries in there. We could use it for tailgating. We could use it for various things. I haven't figured out yet if this uh, this little uh, rack in here will come out or not to give us a, a bigger space. The uh, the thing that I find most interesting and had, had to adapt to is the uh, the flat front panel. You know, vehicles have always had a radiator, and that was always the distinguishing feature of almost every brand is what their grill looks like. And this is just a flat panel, but it has a very prominent uh, Mustang logo there. Uh, they're going to make a GT version of this, a little higher performance that I think is going to have a fake grill. It's going to look more like a traditional car, it'll, but it's just like a decal or something. You know. But anyway, uh, that, that's the one feature of the car that's a little odd to me, but I think that, that sort of fits in with, uh, with the standard look of most electric vehicles. You've got flat space on the front. You don't need a grill, and you try to use that stuff decoratively. I think also for aerodynamics, you don't, you don't want actually air passes through the front. Um, walking around the car here, uh, the... Um, the charger is on the left front fender or, or where the charge is. Yeah. And I, th I think this is a standard plug that all, everything but Tesla uses the same plug. Uh, we do our charging at home. All of our charging has been at home so far. I was going to say the, the badging on this, they call it, ours is called a Mach-E 4X. So obviously the Mach-E is the overall brand and they have various configurations of Mach-E's. The 4 stands for uh, all-wheel drive. Uh, four-wheel drive, and then the X is an extended battery. One of the options is to get an extended battery. We got both. I think if you get a two-wheel drive with extended battery, the, the 300 mile range. Ours with the all-wheel drive, the extended battery is 270 mile range. We haven't come anywhere close to that yet. Uh, another unique feature to this car that has been pretty cool, and our grandkids love it, and uh, everybody that's seen it is where are the door handles. There are no door handles. Traditional door handles, anyway. Um, it has buttons here, and on the driver's side, you just push the button and it pops open and it has a little handle to grab it and pull it open. It's kind of neat. Even on, on the back doors, there are the door handles, there's just a button to pull and it pops open and grab it and pull it um, see this, Charles. I don't want to bend down here, but um, another feature of the uh, the first edition, it has a, a door plate here. This is first edition. There's red stitching. It really makes it distinguish that we have a black interior. You can get black with Santa. The black interior has red, red stitching that really stands out. It gives it a sports car look and feel. It's on the seat, steering wheel, and also on some of the dash. I know last week when we were at the parade, that was something that people had in common. Red stitching that was kind of cool. And that, again, that's a unique feature just to the. Um, it has an all glass um, uh, roof. And I guess structurally, it, it doesn't need to have metal. So it looks black from the outside when you get inside. It's from the front all the way to past the rear passenger seats. It's, it's all glass, so you have a have a clear vision of the sky riding. The, uh, around the rear, I'll, I'll show inside. For inside, it's got a fairly, fairly large uh, capacity uh, storage area. And the, uh, the back seats go down. I'm not sure if I can. There we go. There's a cavity here. We have we have a portable charger, and that's what we're using at home now. The portable charger is hooked up. It's sort of a permanent status, but we can also pull that out and throw it in the rear of the car and take it with us. It came with a um, uh, wheel uh, tire a tire uh, pump, which we didn't expect. So that was a nice feature. Not to buy a tire pump. And uh, probably the most distinct feature on this car that ties it together with the Heritage 53 rear Heritage of the Mustang is the rear. Like three vertical bars on each side. That, that's the distinguishing feature that's carried over. So, the very first Mustang in 1964. Uh, there's a few other things before the body style and, and sort of the curvature of the body that would tell you that sort of the Mustang is For some reason, one of, the, one of the features of this car, and I think this is going to be universal to Ford, they're going to uh, not have keys. Uh, your your phone will be a key. And for some reason, my phone is not connecting to the car, so it thinks I'm uh, somebody trying to steal the car. <laughs> and But actually, it's, it's almost like your cell phone. You have a passcode, so you don't need a key. You can just put in the passcode and get the car going, which I'm doing right now because it's, for some reason, the uh, my phone is not connected. 
so on, on the interior here, uh, it has a, it has a display right right behind the steering wheel as the normal um, speedometer kind of thing. It, it shows your um, your range where 100 percent charged. I had it charged up last night. Uh, it's showing the hoods up, but it'll it'll show your speed and it'll it'll show your. Um, it also shows uh, anything that might be close to the car if you've got another vehicle getting close to you. It has all these sensors and cameras on the car, so it's as I understand it, it's enabled. For um, you know, auto automated driving eventually, it's going to have over-the-air upgrades, just like like Tesla. And at some point, it'll be able to drive itself. Uh, it's got the technology built in to do that. Um, I'm, I'm showing you the big the big center console uh, uh, screen here, and uh, I've, I've looked at some Teslas last week, and I know I've driven some in the past. Uh, it has a similar, very large uh, display. You know, it's like a super-sized iPad, and this one is turned vertical in a more portrait style. Um, uh, configuration the way it's set here i know our grandkids got in and said cool this has got a big movie screen in it well it's not used for movies but it's everything else and um one, one of the kind of the neat things is you set the profile it's like it's like a smartphone and I, I guess a lot of the electric cars are like this and a lot of the cars of the future of any kind will be like this it uh it sort of knows who you are you set your profile if my phone connected to it it would automatically go to my configuration all of what my seating would be adjusted, my mirrors would be adjusted, my radio station would be adjusted to my preferences, all that. The temperature would be set to my uh, preferences. Um, so anyway, lots of things that we still haven't figured it all out. Uh, but one, one of the, uh, there's a couple of features here that I just wanted to highlight. Uh, driving modes is probably the coolest thing that I think is probably unique to the Mustang because it is based on a historic sort of a sports, sports car that Ford has built. Um, they have different driving modes uh, they, they have the, the first one is called Whisper, which is more the normal driving, and you 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 know you, you, your steering is is efficient and uh, and and it's quiet and, and it, it handles well on on roads, you know, going around curves and things. But it's sort of a you know, sort of a neutral feel for the driver's seat. Uh, you can step it up to engage, and, and when you do that, then you get a little more feel of the road and the steering wheel. You get a little more feel of the of the road and you know in the seat. Okay, I'm talking about unbridled here, which is their uh, sort of sports car feel. And, you know, it's all done by computer and it's all simulation, but it'll actually pump in the sound of, you know, the engine will, you'll, you'll hear, a, you know, like a gasoline engine coming through the speakers inside the car. Outside it's still quiet, but inside you get the sensation that you're driving a, a sports car and it gives you that feel. Okay, so it's, it's not really, I don't have a good enough signal to do it from inside the vehicle, but I, I was just talking about the different uh, driving modes. And I'll, I'll just wrap up by two things is um, I've set the um, I, I set even though I don't have a rate, my company doesn't yet have a rate to incent me to charge off peak. I've still set it to charge, you know, starting at eight o'clock at night, overnight. And uh, eventually uh, my company will have a, a, an incentive rate to do that. The other thing that doesn't work that well, and I think I don't know if the problem is with the app. It's probably more the app than it is the car. And I need to get with Ford and figure this out. You can set your departure time. So this week, my wife was leaving at 6 a.m. on Wednesday and 6 a.m. on Friday. And it's supposed to condition the, the cabin. So it'll already be heated from your home connection uh, when, when you go in. And it'll also be fully charged. And when she got in the car on uh, Wednesday morning, it was not fully charged and it was not warm. And it said your next departure is 6 a.m. on Friday. For some reason, it missed that one setting on the departure time. So we've got to work that out. Uh, I think that's a technology glitch, I think between the app and, and the vehicle itself. But, um, you know, it's a nice feature to have once once we get that sorted out. Uh, and I, uh, Charles, I'll just wrap up by mentioning, I, you know, I work as a vice president at Rep. Annie Co-op and uh, we're, we're fairly progressive in the co-op world and the utility world of offering new and innovative energy efficiency and renewable energy programs. and. I personally and my company has been interested in, in electric vehicles, transportation, electrification for quite a while. We've got two bolts in our fleet. We love to take them out to community events. Um, and we, we really wanted something unique and different for an incentive uh, charging rate for our, for our uh, member owners. And uh, Dominion and APCO have both offered sort of pilots with, um, with separate meters. It's very expensive to install a second uh, utility meter, and we didn't want to do that. We wanted to try to use the metering capability, either of a smart charger or of the car itself. It's, it's recording its consumption when it's, when it's charging, and uh, we haven't quite solved that technology piece yet to get that data and get it into our, you know, our billing system to be able to, to do that. 
So we're going to we're going to have a simpler uh, approach. But uh, our pilot has been pending in front of the State Corporation Commission for uh, for a few months now. Uh, on April 15th, we'll be refiling to shortly short to change it uh, slightly to allow for a, a rebate for folks who charge off peak. And we're just going to ask them to send us their, uh, you know, a picture of their car, of their app, uh, showing where they have set it up to charge during the uh, the appropriate off peak hours. And we'll give them a bill credit and we can check. We have smart meters so we can check, you know, behind it on spot check and uh, and make sure they are following through. But I think once you, once you set your charging hours, uh, typically you're not going to touch that. So, we're really uh, hopeful uh, the commission and we think will embrace this as a, as a test and we'll get this up and going uh, later this year. And uh, maybe, maybe that'll be the new norm for how, you know, consumers and owners of electric vehicles can get even more savings on their, uh, their charging, fueling their car with electricity by doing it during uh, appropriate off peak times. Well, David, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, I was asking a quick question related to that. Are there any plans, and, and if, if, you, if you can, that's, that's okay. Are there any plans for the co-op to install charging stations? Yes. Um, well, we, we are not sure we want to be in the, uh, the, the charging business ourselves. We're still uh, kind of working on that from a strategy standpoint. Uh, we have made the decision to install some chargers at our headquarters office in Fredericksburg. I think we'll be putting in four. So we have a handful of employees that have electric vehicles and we're going to anticipate more. So we're going to have, uh, you know, workplace charging. And I went through an experience just recently of getting a home charging set up. And we certainly want to be an advisor to our members of, you know, where to go and how to get an electrician. And we may even be eventually helping to install home chargers. We see that as something that we could bring some uh, value to our, our member owners. And then the whole thing of public public charging, and uh, do we have some role in that? Uh, we're we're exploring that, whether it's uh, you know passenger vehicles or large trucks. We we serve a lot of areas along 95, 64, 66, and 81, and there's going to be a lot of uh, uh, truck traffic. I think that will eventually use uh, you know battery powered electric uh, power, and we'll, we'll need a place to charge efficiently and quickly. And those 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 use a lot of power. They take a lot of. Uh, a lot of demand, uh, you know, when they when they connect, like a, a semi truck connects to, uh, you know, to a charger. So, all, all that is on in our future, and we're looking at trying to sort it out. We, I know the General Assembly just passed uh, a couple of bills this session, and one in particular, they they've given the uh, some direction to the State Corporation Commission to do some further investigation of any policies that need to be changed or anything that needs to do to sort of clear the way for transportation electrification. So, uh, we'll be part of that process, and I see the utilities being a, a key player in helping to make this happen. Awesome. Thank you for, for, for mentioning that, uh, David. Uh, the other question I'll throw in real quick and I'll open the floor to other questions. I always ask this question out of EV owners is I always like the answers that people give. So why did you decide to go electric? Because you know, uh, you know, the, 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 there's many reasons and categories, if you will, for EV owners as there are EV owners, you know, the environmental, there's, you know, they like the performance, so forth and so on. What were some of your reasons and how did that, how's that played out so far since you bought the mach -E? Yeah, I, I think it's a combination of everything. I sort of started telling my story. You know, I've, I've been a Mustang fan, you know, for 40, 40 something years. So I was really excited that they moved in the direction of having really even even a, a SUV, which is this is sort of the the highest uh, market car right now. This is the car that most people kind of want. You know, this kind of configuration. It was perfect for our lifestyle. Uh, the electric is something I've been hugely interested in for a long time. Um, Personally, you know, our company is, is involved in lots of things in the renewable energy and uh, energy efficiency area that comes under my area, working on policies in that area. So it was it was sort of a combination of interest in cars, interest in, in Mustangs in particular, uh, being a, an electric utility guy and seeing the transportation electrification is so exciting that this is a convergence in, in my career of the things that I, I like. Uh, you know, personally with cars and transportation and things and coming together with electric utility work that I've done my whole career. And, uh, you know, and, and I love technology. This is everything we, we all, my wife and I both love technology and, uh, you know, we're always looking out for the, the newest, um, you know, Apple devices or, or smart TVs, whatever it is. So we're, we're kind of early adopters of technology too. So um, I, I think it's just a combination of everything. And I, I would consider us to be, environmentally conscious we've got grandkids and i certainly want to leave the planet uh, better than than it was when we were kids you know for future generations in our family and 
So it sort of fits in with our lifestyle. We have geothermal heat pumps and I spent the morning replacing all of my garage lights with LEDs and <laughs> on down the line. You know, our, our lifestyle is sort of worked on uh, and focused on, on efficiency and uh, trying to minimize our environmental impact, too. So I, I, I may be unique of having kind of all these things converging in one thing, but it just, uh, you know, it, it did. And that was something that we uh, my wife and I agree on that and felt like that was something we, we really uh, agreed on. Never, never hesitated for a moment when we knew this car was going to be available to go ahead and get in, get in the queue and get one. It's interesting to, to make that comment because about all the things converging because I've met more than one EV owner that also has solar or, you know, is also interested in like energy efficiency. So I think that oftentimes yeah. those things tend to be very complementary, you know. That right, you, right. Once you, you use electricity as your fuel for your vehicle, you start thinking about where electricity comes from. So. Right. All right, well, I'll open the floor to questions. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, that uh, presentation, David. And uh, again, apologies to those of us who are, will be watching this on Facebook and later on on YouTube that uh, uh, there are some internet issues at David's house. And so he was kind enough to actually to drive uh, to uh, the Montpelier uh, Center uh, to use their Wi-Fi. So I thank you very much for going the extra mile, uh, no pun intended, uh, to, to... <laughs> So uh, any questions for David about the, the Maki or about you know, Rappahannock uh, Co-op, for that matter, and their policies and EVs. Hey, David, I've got a question for you. Uh, a friend of mine, Jim Claypool, uh, asked me to ask you if, if you used to work for Dominion Power. I sure did. Yeah, I was there for uh, <laughs> about 30 years, and uh, I left in 2011, went to the co-op. So I'm at the co-op okay. 10 years now. Yeah, he, I, I sold him a, uh, a vote when I was with uh, Haley Chevrolet, and then he's now driving a Bolt EV. Okay. And he asked me if you were that, that guy, and apparently you are. I am that guy, yeah. I'll tell Jim I said hello. I will. Cool. Um, I see that uh, some folks are joining us. Uh, I see Ken, Ken has joined us, and Humphrey has joined us, in addition to Wall. Do uh, you guys have any, any questions or or, or, or uh, comments on the Maki. This is a good opportunity. Uh, I mean, David's had the car for about a month now, but uh, it sounds like he's already you know, uh, gotten quite a bit of knowledge here under his belt. Did you special? Yeah, Charles, uh, I think um, I've, I saw this morning that uh, Cars and Coffee over at Regency, the, uh, Richmond Ford has a demonstrator now, a white uh, Maki they had over there this morning. If the weather's nice, uh, my wife and I'll be down there uh, uh, in two weeks. We're, we're going to come out on the 3rd of April, I think. So if you get a chance to come by, we'll hope to see you there. Did you special order that car or did you just take it out of stock? Yeah, uh, we, we special ordered this. We put in a reservation way back in November 19, and then we ordered it last July, and we went with the first edition. We wanted the Rapid Red, so we got sort of custom every everything we wanted and had to wait patiently for months for it to get here. But uh, glad we did. That's a beautiful color. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I got to say that that red looks really nice in person. Um, I wish I had a chance to sit in your car, you know, because I, I was kind of, I was joking with my wife that uh, you know, the, the, the Maki, definitely the, the styling of it, you know, just definitely a, appeals to me. Um, so, but, so maybe I just need to sit in the car and maybe, maybe do the test drive at the Richmond Ford uh, and get, get it out of my system. I mean, I just bought a bolt for crying out loud. You know, I'm not gonna be right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. From what I, what I've read, this is this is sort of a huge risk for Ford. I think it's paying off. It's too early to tell, but to, to take you know, their iconic brands that have been around for decades is Mustang and F one fifty, and uh, they took the Mustang and, and put the label on on this on electric car. So that's the future. Their new CEO says this is the future of the industry and the future of their company, and staking it to it. And they they've got the F one fifty in development. And it should be available in the next year or two. And uh, if you if you don't keep up, you're going to be behind. They're they're going to lose out. So I think Chevy's doing the same thing. From what I gather, GM has made the same commitment to to go electric. My first car was a '67 Mustang back in the day. All right. <laughs> <laughs> what one of the cool things? Uh, my granddaughters are are six six and nine now, and we take the old car. We'll take the new car. Some we do we do parades like in uh, Beaver Dam and Ashland and Mechanicsville at Christmas time and Fourth of July. <laughs> And uh, they instantly recognize Mustangs as we're driving a parade route. Uh, little kids, you know, people our generation say, I had one. So many people can identify because they drove a Mustang. And then even little kids recognize the pony and they recognize the Mustang. It's like an instantly recognizable for generations, you know, 50 years later. 
young young kids still recognize that brand and logo. So it's it's really cool. Uh, David was sharing this with me uh, the other day that uh, it, it's interesting using that Mustang because there's been some bit of a debate about using the Mustang name on you know on an SUV. Um, and it, but it's interesting you know, that you know from a marketing standpoint because um, you know, now that EVs have moved up into the crossover SUV side of the market from the smaller sedans and smaller cars that uh, it's sort of an attempt to kind of try to appeal to the, I guess, the boomer generation that maybe you know, has right. a higher income, needs a bigger car. And so right. I, I think from that standpoint, it's, a, it's an interesting marketing choice. It'll be interesting to see if Chevy follows and does a, you know, a Camaro, something like this. <laughs> they, they've done a retro style, uh, you know, uh, late model uh, Camaro that looks sort of like the, uh, the originals in the sixties and seventies. They may do the same thing, you know, do an electric and do well, an SUV. I heard that um, GM is actually working on electrifying the Corvette to some extent, at least the oh. hybrid. Yeah, at least okay. the hybrid, but they say there's space for it. And, you know, if they're going to pick a brand to do, Corvette would be the one for them. But, That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting strategy. I read about the, what they were thinking about the Corvette, that, that it seemed like they were sort of keeping that door open for the future. And then I think it goes back to a comment that David made that in that car makers are seeing that says not just the, it's i would say that not just as the future but the future is here you know that that, that the yeah, yeah. combination of policy changes and then just consumer preferences and so forth you know it, it's 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 definitely moving more of the market towards electrification i mean the past year you know auto sales were down significantly overall but ev sales were actually up for, uh, as, as, a, as a market segment um, and that I think speaks volumes in terms of you know, there's a continued interest in trying, you know, for the various reasons that people like electric vehicles. And, and, and you know, from my standpoint, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a win for the environment, too, because the more people are in EVs, that's, uh, you know, that's, that's cutting down the amount of you know, pollution and the amount of, uh, you know, the carbon that's uh, affecting the, uh, the climate. Uh, Ken, I didn't know if you had any comments or questions. I know you're probably just uh, listening in, but uh, I didn't know if you wanted to. To, to toss in any, uh, any any questions. Okay, I think he's just in the list mode right now. I'll ask. I'll throw another quick question and give other folks time to think of something because the other thing I like to also ask you know, EV owners too is like, what the most unusual place that you've charged? Um, because uh, you know, but, you know, for the most part, you know, EV owners charge at home, but then you know, you go on a road trip, you're just out and about. And I'm curious if you had like what's the most unusual place you charge or most usual like charging experience you've had so far. I mentioned we've we've only had the vehicle like five weeks now, so it's all the charging has been at home. Okay. And that I'll I'll just mention you know that was a challenge to kind of figure that out. The uh, the local Ford dealer was almost no help. I mean I don't think they are trained yet to be good advisors. And I knew I needed a home uh, charging setup before I brought the vehicle home. And I knew it was going to be like January, February. And I was getting a little anxious in November. Okay? And then I finally was able to find on Ford's website, like a video and spec sheets for an electrician, you know, uh, to how to go about charging it. Then I participated in another uh, forum like this. It wasn't, wasn't sure. I can't remember uh, where it was, but uh, some, some long, longer term electric vehicle uh, drivers and owners talking about they just use the portable charger they didn't buy the more expensive uh, smart chargers and just get the wiring make sure you got 240 volt and enough amperage that you can charge in a you know, relatively short period of time overnight so i kind of figured it out without any assistance from you know the, the manufacturer or the local dealer and uh, now i you know anybody that asked me i'll kind of tell them about my experience i found a local electrician and did the wiring we had it all set up a few weeks before uh, we haven't yet taken a road trip uh, we're planning one two weeks from now we're going to see my mom and my wife's dad over in the valley and uh, you know we'll need to need to top off uh, somewhere around stanton at the walmart there there's uh, i think it's electrify america there is a public charging station there so we can kind of plan our trip around you know 20 minutes 30 minutes whatever it is at walmart and go in and pick up a few things and uh and be fully charged to get or at least have enough charge to get back home uh haven't really thought about a longer trip you know where you have you know you're, you know, you're tri traveling a thousand miles or going going to another you know another state or something we haven't yet mapped that out we, we do camping and uh usually the longer term trips are with our camper but uh i think we'll eventually do that we'll get confident there'll be enough charging stations and there'll be 
fast charger so you can not have to lose a lot of time on the road while you're traveling. I, I guess that's a, that's a challenge. You can usually top off with gasoline in 10 minutes and be gone. The electric may take a little longer. You just need to build that into your, your planning. Thank you for that. Um, and uh, you, you bring up an interesting point about the you know, the, the, you know, the, the charging habits at home. And, you know, a, a question that I've had because I've, I've switched to uh, uh, EV with a, a larger battery. And uh, what's the size of the battery on the, the Mach-E? I always, I forget. Like, what's the, I what forget too. I know, see, we got the extended. I just, you know, I know it's, I know the range, but I don't know the- Wait, What's the range? 270. 270, this okay. One. Yeah. So okay. what's that? It's like 88 kilowatt hours, I think. It may be. I think it's like 58 and 88, something like that. Yeah, that, that sounds about right. Yeah. It's pretty good. For, good range for that size battery. Because, uh, But, uh, yeah, I went from a, an EV with a smaller battery to a and small, shorter range to a longer range. And one thought across the line is like, how often do I plug this thing? And especially with the you know pandemic, I'm not going out as much. I, mean, I was charging my Leaf be every other day. Um, but... I've got so much range now that I think, well, do, do I keep it plugged in? I'm curious to know what your charging habits are. Like, do you plug it in every day or like, uh, what, what do you, what do you do? Uh, th thus far, that's been the practice, even if it was still, you know, three quarter charged because we wanted to use it to do the, the cabin conditioning, the car, the inside of the car using the, uh, the, the, the house uh, current power as opposed to using the battery. But, um, we, we haven't quite figured that out, but I know on those cold mornings when my wife leaves, it's nice when the car is already warm inside and uh, has done that from, you know, from the house as opposed to having to use it from the battery. So I think if we can figure out and get this departure time thing on the, on the app to work correctly, that's going to be our pattern is just to plug it up every day so that it's either cooled or warmed, you know, be, be ready to go and fully charged every day. Cool. Um, yeah, because of the... the uh, yeah, it's interesting that, that trying to, yeah, the, the conditioning part, uh, from what I was reading on some of the, because uh, I asked that question on a, on a Chevy Bolt owners page on Facebook, and it was written, the questions, the, the answers are very interesting because all, there are a large number of people uh, that said that, well, you should keep it plugged in, one for the reasons you said about, you know, keeping the, you know, the, that way you can keep the cabin, the, the right temperature that you want when you get in without having to use the battery in the car, but also actually it helps to condition the battery of the car as well because of the, 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 the when it's left plugged in, at least with the bolt, and, and I think this is true of other EVs as well, that um, for those cars that use uh, active battery management, it's actually using some energy to, to make sure that the, the car's battery doesn't get too hot or too cold. Uh, and so that's right. a little bit for that. And so for that reason, they say, well, go ahead and leave it plugged in. So that way, again, you're not using battery power. You're just using you know some grid energy to kind of, just make sure right. that, that the battery is always happy. So, okay. interesting uh, take on that. All right, uh, any other questions? I've got a question for some other owners. <laughs> Sure. I, I had read things, and maybe this was maybe this was Tesla only, but I, I had read some things before we you know acquired this vehicle that said you really shouldn't charge to 100% capacity. That you know 80% was sort of optimal to extend battery life and never let it go below 20% charge and never really go above 80 was sort of the optimal range but nothing in the ford literature says that you know the, the local dealer rep doesn't, doesn't really know but he just said i don't see any reason i, don't, I haven't seen anything in an advisory you know, technical bulletin or anything that would suggest don't charge to 100 percent. so that's what we're doing but i'm not sure that's optimal just curious if anybody else has had that experience or has has technical knowledge about that well, well i'm not certain what ford's strategy is right now but GM strategy has always been to that. They never let you charge to 100%. They totally control it. So when it says 100%, it's typically around 80. Oh, really? Okay. Now, with the Bolt, I know it's a little bit different. There's this thing you can go a full 100%, but I'm not still not certain if that's really 100% of the battery or it's like 95% or something like okay. that. Okay. Clearly, on, a, on, on GM vehicles, when it says zero, you're not at zero. You're probably at 15 or maybe 20%. Okay. He wants to go up. Ford may be more like Tesla. Now, Tesla is really more of the zero means zero and 100 means 100. And right. you really say 80% for daily use is, 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 you know, the, is good. But if you're going to do it to 100%, go to 100%, but immediately leave on a trip. Okay. 
Uh, so Walt, I know he stepped away for a month. So Walt, uh, uh, David actually had a really good question, which was, uh, do you, do, should he charge his uh, car to 100% all the time? I think it would depend on the, the type of driving you plan to do. If you're going to obviously take a long trip, you definitely want as much range as you can possibly get. Right. Um, I've heard that with most electric vehicles, to maintain battery life, you do want to charge pretty close to 100%, 80 or 80 or 90 percent at least. Okay. Good. Yeah, I kind of heard this something less than 100, but uh, nothing in the Ford technical bulletins or any of the literature or any, anybody at local Ford dealer doesn't seem to know exactly what the optimal you know charging strategy is to extend the life full life. Yeah, it's a, that's a really, really good question. And, and I, I will say that one reason maybe there's not necessarily a technical bulletin on, on it is that, you know, so it, so the short answer is that a lot of the, the, the time, and this, for, for some vehicles, I know with the, the Nissan Leaf, they mentioned it specifically in the manual, and I know for other vehicles as well, they recommend that you don't let the car go to, and there's, the main thing is not to let the battery go all the way down and then we proceed to then charge it all the way up and then conversely charge it all the way up to hundred percent and then let it drop all the way down. Because right. uh, in terms of the, lo the longevity of the battery, whenever you're like, let's say close to zero and you start to charge, um, it's going to charge slowly at first because of the way the electrons are going into the battery. I'm not hundred percent clear on explaining the physics of it, but basically, you know, it's a little bit that that first like 10 or 20%, there's some resistance until the battery kind of warms up, so to speak. And then you get optimal charging conditions. Then when you get up to like 90, 80, 90%, um, the battery will tend to, the, ba the battery chemistry, in order to preserve that, uh, the charging rate will start to drop a little bit. And because, it, because you're, you know, the resistance is increasing basically. So in other words, and especially when you get that last five to 10%, to get it to, up to that 100, you're having to overcome a lot of resistance in the battery in order to get that charge in there. So over the long run, if you do that a lot, you know, there's there, that that's going to affect the battery. And it depends on the car, you know, the chemistry of the car specifically and how and how the uh, charge rate is managed. Um, so, you know, and there's people go go all over the map in terms of like some owners say, oh, you shouldn't do that too often. And, you know, and some of them say the reverse, that, that they're actually doing that every now and again intentionally, like you should go see, use a DC fast charger right now, it helps to condition the battery over the long run. You know, I think the, 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 what it, where the consensus is, is that it's gonna, that, that, that consistently doing that, that you're going, dropping it way, way down to then and charging it or, or going up all the way up to 100 um, is gonna impact the battery, but the, that impact is gonna vary. And so if you're the right. kind of person who holds onto their vehicle for like 10 years or 15 years, like I do, that may be something you might not think about for longevity sake. If you're the kind of person who trades their car in every three to five years, what difference does it make? You know, it, right. you know, it, it may be so small that it's not going to make a difference in your everyday driving and, you know, you're going to trade it in anyway. So uh, that, that's sort of where I think the consensus. Yeah, yeah. You know, with the thermal management system, it's important to keep it plugged in for that reason, um, because it, it maintains stability on the battery when you do that. And also preconditioning, when you want to precondition the vehicle, either in winter or summer, uh, you right. want to have it plugged in for that as well. <laughs>